Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Father John Burns, and uh, so happy to be with you today to speak a little bit about the heart of man and the heart of Christ. Let's uh, jump in with a prayer, shall we? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we place our lives before your gaze, and we ask that you would stir within us your gifts, your blessings, deepen within us a spirit, a desire to be like Christ, to be perfected in our masculinity, that we would be brothers, husbands, and fathers according to the pattern of God. Mother Mary be with us here as well. Teach us the way of the woman's heart, that for her we could all be men after Christ's heart. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, this morning, gentlemen, I want to speak about the topic of masculinity. And again, as I said in the prayer, the heart of man and the heart of Christ. And in particular, uh, the fact that the idea that God comes in the flesh to perfect what has been imperfected by sin or trapped beneath the, the weight, the burden of the fall. So our topic around that is how to live authentic masculinity. And I really want to kind of frame that actually and speak of Christological masculinity, kind of a mouthful of a phrase, but I want to hold that up as, as really the ideal for what men of Christ is aiming for, that we would be men after the heart of Christ and that our masculinity wouldn't be toxic, wouldn't be confused, wouldn't be reduced. It would be a Christological masculinity. Toward that end, I want to just point out that the, the, the question of what a man is, what a, a woman is, what masculinity is, what femininity is, these are conundrums for our culture today, and I'm not going to engage a lot of those debates, but I will point out that in some ways, culture does have an influence on the way that, that we express ourselves as men. You know, for example, a man will express himself differently and bear himself differently in the court of a king or in the parliament than he will on his way to a football game, let's say in a small town in Wisconsin. But despite the, the fact of culture's influence on the way that, that men express themselves and masculinity kind of lives within a culture, there are a lot of features of what it is to be a man, masculinity, that are not malleable. That they can't be changed and they're independent even of cultural expression. They're so profound that they're revealed to us by God. And, and this, for this point, we, we lean upon sacred scripture, God's revelation, within which he tells us an awful lot about who we are and how we're called to live. And specifically, to, to get at these themes today, I want to anchor us deeply in God's revelation and do that specifically by looking at the very first things God chose to reveal to us, the beginning of the Bible, the beginning of his revelation, the book of Genesis. And even there, to start with the very most fundamental things, Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Now, we've all probably read these passages. You probably know that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, there are two different creation accounts. In the first, we have the seven days of creation. On the sixth day, the last day of God's work, he creates the man and the woman. On the seventh day, he rests. And then we have Genesis 2, which is this other creation account. And I didn't used to know what to do with that. I used to skip over it, really, and go Genesis 1, this other account, Genesis 3, the fall, which is very important. But between the two, Genesis 2 actually offers us a very important insight into man and woman distinctly. Because whereas in Genesis 1, the man and the woman are created in the same moment, or it's revealed to us that on the last day, that the apex of creation, God creates his finest uh, artifact, his greatest creature, man and woman. In Genesis 2, the man is created first, and he's created and he's placed in the garden. And the text itself of Genesis 2 is really helpful for us here. As God creates the man, it says he took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. So as man begins his existence, first man, the man b before the fall, he begins set in a garden and has a specific relationship with God and with work. Man begins as a laborer, as a worker. He's placed in the garden to till it, to keep it. He's cooperating with, he's partnering with God. Dominus, Lord. He's sharing in the dominion of the Lord to be a worker and a laborer. And that actually is transmitted down through every generation of humanity. All, all men have an ache, a desire to work, and we take meaning from our work. We're, we're united with our work as something that matters to us because man from the beginning is revealed to us by God as a laborer. Now, we know how the story goes that the Lord sees that after a while the man is, is incomplete in himself. It's not enough just for him to share in the Lord's dominion. Scripture actually says it's not good, the Lord says, it's not good that the man should be alone, so I'll make a suitable helper for him, 
or a helpmate for the man. And we know how this goes. God creates the animals. Man extends or deepens his participation in the Lord's dominion, now by ordering even the creatures, giving them names, which is a lordly or a godly act. And so we see again, man partnering with God, cooperating with God in organizing, bringing order to and establishing this dwelling place, the garden. We know as this goes on though, this, this is the search that man is searching out for a place to rest his heart, searching for a suitable other with whom to share this dwelling place that he's helped to establish in partnership with God. He's searching for a spouse. He doesn't find one among the animals as we know. And so the Lord casts a deep sleep upon the man, draws forth the rib and he creates the woman. Now this is the key moment and I wanna carry this with you through the whole talk as a, a development, a maturation, and really like an unleashing of the heart of man. The man has been a worker, he's been a partner with God, he's been cooperating with the Lord. Something very distinct happens when he encounters the woman. That his search has led him to weariness, He's not been able to find a place to rest his heart. The Lord puts him to sleep. And then the Lord, as he creates this woman, the scripture says, then he brings the woman to the man. So they're created apart. While the man is sleeping, the woman is created somewhere else. And then she, he, she's brought to the man. And as the man sees the woman, something happens in his heart that has not yet happened. No longer is he a laborer, a worker. He actually becomes a poet. And it's said very often that man, the moment he sees a woman, uh, becomes a poet. Even Plato is said to, have, to remark that um, every single man who's touched by love becomes a poet in himself. And that, that kind of attributed phrase actually is proof of revelation. And revelation really does actually manifest this fact. I asked a buddy of mine who's a biblical scholar, is that true? Is man really a poet? Like, what do people mean by that? Well, the textual, uh, the, the, the flow of the text is a narrative flow in Hebrew all the way up until Genesis 2, 23. In Genesis 2, 23, the text changes. And this is our line in English. Then the man said, as soon as he sees the woman, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. And it's that little at last phrase that has, has captured my attention, my prayer, and my preaching for, for several years now. It's this exasperated outcry of the man who's been searching, looking around and trying to find a place to rest his heart. And finally he finds her, the other, the woman, and finds this great relief. And out of that relief, out of that rest from his restlessness, he cherishes her beauty. He sees in her something he could not find in any other animal, in any other creature. And he begins to sing poetry. He begins to cherish beauty and speak even a language that's new to the human family. The moment the man sees the woman, he in fact does become a poet. And she awakens in him some power that was latent that he wasn't even aware of. And that's woman's gift to man. She changes man's heart. That man, as I say, begins as a laborer, but then once he sees the woman, she brings a logic to his labor. All of a sudden he has someone to work for, not just some idea, not just some product, not just some output, but a person. And his desire is to work well for her, is to establish a place in which they can share life and raise up new life and to defend and to protect that place so that the life of the garden, the paradisius day, the paradise where we lived with God can unfold according to the plan of God. That's the ideal and that's written into the heart of humanity that man himself by revelation is called to work and is called not just to work for the sake of product, but for the sake of love. Man is called to be a laborer in love. And in that context, again, objective revealed truth, we recognize as well that the man delights in bringing a blessing to the woman as he receives the blessing of her receiving his love. This is the structure of humanity. In philosophical terms, what we're getting at here is a principle called the dyadic structure of the created order, a tricky phrase. But what it means is that God, when he chose to uh, allow us to share in his creative work, when he, when he called us to procreate, when he took the power to generate and put it down into the created order, he took that power and he divided it into two parts, male and female, and he turned those parts back toward each other and made them dependent upon each other, not just for the work of generation, if you will, the cooperation with the gift of life, but also he turned them toward each other for the sake of being able to learn about who one is and who one isn't. 
or through alterity, a relationship with another, to discover that the other brings something out of me that would not have been brought out had I stayed alone. This dyadic structure is carried down through creation and is actually a tremendous gift in its origin. The principle that I want, yes, I want to ask you guys to hold on to and maybe even discuss later on is the fact that in all of scripture, all of creation, the good precedes the evil. A lot of the time we're talking about masculinity, we kind of get hung up on trying to define what is and is not masculinity and to parse it out from what sin has done and to, to narrate through kind of what's happening in our culture and our world. But we have to look at Revelation and remember the good, the origin, the structure of masculinity by origin is good. That it's good that man wants to work and be productive and wants his labors to be seen and fruitful. It's good that man longs to give himself to a woman. It's good that man cherishes the beauty of woman. It's good that man sees the woman as another. It's good that he would see her as a suitable helpmate, a place to rest his heart, one made by God for him to bring rest to him in his labors and in his search. All of that is good. Unfortunately, we insert sin. And sin confuses disorders, obfuscates, contradicts, and, and razzles around all of the original goods to make everything a little bit distorted and confusing. There's this contortion that sin brings into man's relationships. I want to trace each of these out and look with you then at how Jesus restores, redeems, and makes possible a perfected masculinity. And by perfected, I don't mean flawless, I mean a type of masculinity that achieves the divine ideal, that rises up to the divine possibility, which was put into us by origin, which got messed up by sin, but then was reestablished in Christ Jesus. Which is why we say that to be a man after Christ's heart is to be an excellent man, a good man, a perfected man in philosophical terms. So now to grasp and to look at uh, the effect of sin upon man's relationships. The first effect of sin that I want to point out, and again, you would have read these in sacred scripture, but I want to trace it a little bit further than the text actually gives us into how we notice broken masculinity uh, affecting us and even breaking our hearts, the hearts of our families and the hearts of our world. First, the, the dilemma of sin causes a rupture in our relationship with the Lord. The original gift is that we were partnered with God. We were cooperating with God. We trusted God's paternity, God's fatherhood, and we delighted to work with God. That the twisting of sin through which we ask, is God really a good God? Is God really trustworthy? Could I really submit my will to God? Leads us eventually to say non serviam with the Israelites and even with the enemy. I, I will not serve. I will not submit my will to another. I have to have the final say. We move from cooperation with the dominion of God into a disobedience, a wrestling for power, a competing with God that leads us in turn to exercise an unholy dominion over other people in our lives. A dominion that's not sharing in God's lordship and goodness and ordering presence, but rather one that corrupts. So the rupture in our relationship with God effectively also twists our relationship with women, men with women, masculinity with femininity. Because for the woman who was originally a gift and who was presented to the man as a blessing, now she becomes this challenging question. Who is she? What's my relationship with her? Is she actually a helpmate? Is she an obstacle? Is she a competitor? Is she a friend or a foe? Is she a gift or is she an object? And, and each of us has our broken story in those relationships. And I don't need to trace that out for you, but I think we could all name when we're very honest, the ways that we've stumbled into not seeing woman as a helpmate and in her own brokenness, where woman has not seen herself as a suitable other. And the competition that ensues is just a fruit of the, the contortion, the twisting and the obfuscation of the enemy. The hopefulness here toward which I'm moving is the fact that God comes to restore original goodness. God comes to reach down to the roots and make possible the living out of what he established before sin came in and twisted all this up. The third contortion, corruption and confusion of sin is man's relationship with work. And this one I don't think we spend quite as much time on sometimes. But, but for a good reason do we observe that, that men tend to struggle a little bit more than women with a disordered relationship with their work. Women can be workaholics as well. It's a lot easier for men to become workaholics because we as laborers from origin tend to take a lot of our identity and evaluate our own self-worth on the basis of our work. If our work isn't productive, 
if our careers aren't fulfilling, if we aren't seen for what we're doing, laboring for our families, our friends, professionally in any place, even in the backyard, if our work goes unnoticed, we start to feel like maybe I'm unnoticed or maybe I'm not good because my work isn't bearing good fruit. Additionally, when relationships get corrupted, if woman becomes a competitor instead of a friend or families are shattered and we don't know where else to go, we tend to dive into work. And this actually is a fruit of sin for obvious reasons, but even we can trace from the scriptures. As the Lord in Genesis 3 begins to name the effect of sin and the curse that lands upon the serpent and upon the earth, God says this, cursed is the ground because of you to the man. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you and you shall eat the plants of the field. In the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken and you are dust and unto dust you shall return. It's a heartbreaking curse when you think about it. Because from, from origin, man enjoyed his work and he enjoyed working with the Lord and he enjoyed the fruits of his work as the garden bore good fruit. After the fall, under the effect of sin, all of that is twisted. And our work can be a blessing or it can become for us a curse. By the sweat of our brow, our toil leads us also to conclude that perhaps we're not good men, we're not worthy, we don't have what it takes. As we hear those very things and we reflect on our own experiences of, of not having what it takes, I want to point out one other effect of the fall, which is that as we came out of relationship with God, we also came into relationship with the enemy. And the serpent who first allured us away from God can now speak to our hearts in a way that is new because of sin. And I'm convinced that there's a way we can trace the original lie, the first thing the serpent said to the woman and the first thing the serpent said to the man, we can trace those down through fallen femininity and fallen masculinity. Because for the woman, you know, her first experience of, of existence, her first awareness is being seen by the father who just created her in preparation to bring her to the man. So the Lord had to be somehow delighting in the woman as he had her off to the side if you will, on God's heart is this joy about being able to finally bring rest to the man's heart. So woman experiences from God an affirming gaze of love. And then as she's brought to the man, she experiences from the man a confirmation of what she received from God. In a rightly ordered gaze from the man, the man who's been searching, his gaze bestows upon the woman an awareness that she's a gift, that she's good. And he shares in the Lord's goodness and the delight of the father in his beloved daughter. That's the high ideal, right? For man's gaze, his glance, his look upon the woman. But as the woman falls, and she falls first according to the text, I just have to believe that the serpent seeing this reality, seeing the woman and the man are right there together, the text tells us, that as the woman falls, he had to attack the goodness of if they were together and now he has them apart. And I just wonder if he whispered something like to the woman, look at you, you miserable wretch. You've fallen and he let you fall. That man who you're with did not defend you, did not protect you. He left you. He left you to me and he'll leave you again. He's not safe. And we know that that lie is carried down through the hearts of women the world over. And then what does the man do? He follows her into sin. He takes her the same fruit that she gives to him. He's right there. And I just have to believe that that's the spot where the enemy attacks. He's being right there and not defending her. I have to believe the serpent said something like, look at you to the man, you miserable wretch. You weren't strong enough to defend her. I took her out of your grasp. You don't have what it takes to win this fight. You're not strong enough. You're not good. She doesn't care. She'll leave you again. And is that not translated and carried down through the hearts of men? Gentlemen, the world over. This question we carry, am I strong enough? Am I good enough? Do I have what it takes? Is my gift, is my offering a blessing? And how that contortion of sin plays upon all of our relationships. And we carry those two forward down through the lines of humanity. As men struggle with these lies and women struggle with these lies, we tend to bring this struggle into our relationships and the human family is so easily destroyed if we give in to the fruit of the lie. Now, coming out of the fruit of the lie, we have the story of salvation in which God offered covenant after offering, after offering, after offering to us to invite us back into relationship. We couldn't do it. In the fullness of time, he finally said, you know what? I'm done trying to let you fix this yourselves or inviting you to respond to my gift. I'm going to take up flesh and make it possible for you to share in a new covenant. 
and he took up flesh in Christ Jesus. The fathers of the church very early on saw this tremendous parallel between Adam and Christ. Adam, the first man who took from a tree and fell, Jesus Christ, they called the new Adam, who took to a tree, the new tree of life, and he raised up what had been fallen. And from his side, Adam's side, the woman was born. From Christ's side is born the new woman, the new Eve, the church, the bride. Christ, as he comes into this corrupted and confused world, brings with himself the possibility of seeing what's actually true. He enters the scene to reclaim and redeem and get back to the good that was there before the fall. And as he does so, specifically, he does battle with the enemy of our souls, the ancient foe, the serpent, the one who tricked us and has held us captive since the fall. And I want to point out a very specific thing that Christ does in confronting the enemy. Because what the enemy was after, if we go back to the text, is actually very interesting to ponder. As we look at the curse and the way the Lord explains what happens to the earth, but also to the serpent after the fall, the Lord looks at the serpent and he says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman. It's a fascinating thing to ponder. The, 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 the fruit of sin, the curse, a part of that will be that the woman and the serpent will be in a particular battle. Woman's particular suffering down through the ages is, is quite different than men's. And maybe this would be a controversial thing to say, but I tend to think women suffer more than men. Obviously, in a bodily sense, I think we'd all agree that women have to deal with much more than men. They tend to carry pain in their bodies in a different way, but even emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, certainly culturally, down through history, women have tended to suffer more than men. And I, I just have to believe that's not only cultural conditioning, that's not only the unfolding of human history, that's the fact that the serpent has been ranged against the woman in a particular way. He won the woman by sin first, and he's been attacking her ever since. We see this actually at the end of scripture as well in the book of Revelation. The fullness of all things, there's a dragon and there's a woman clothed in the sun. And the dragon is after the woman and the fruit of her womb, which is an image of Our Lady, but also of the church and all of her children. The enemy hates the children of the church, the fruit of the love of God and his bride. And Christ comes to, to establish that church, to, to rescue humanity, but also to, to craft for himself or redeem for himself, to wash for himself a bride. In that equation, after Christ's victory, in the new covenant until the end of time, every single one of us men has to decide whether we are a friend of the woman or a friend of the serpent. Whether we're willing to come to the defense of women, femininity, the women entrusted to us, the women of our culture, the women of our world, and I'll even trace out with you the church herself, because the church is a bride. We're either friend of woman or friend of the serpent, and, and there's no middle ground. It's one or the other. As we navigate that decision, will we be friend of the serpent or friend of the woman? We have for us as gift, as friend, as brother, and as condition of possibility, Jesus Christ who's not only friend of the woman, he's bridegroom of the woman. And in Jesus Christ is established for us the pattern of a heart, the heart of man, redeemed and restored according to the original, the original design. Man who is a laborer, yes, but who has a logic to his labor, who's willing to work, to sweat, to, to even give up his own life for the sake of his bride. Christological masculinity is a form of leadership in which man takes up his proper role after the good, the gift, the original pattern of man before the fall, reestablished, developed, and, and empowered and equipped by Jesus Christ to live in a new covenant mode in the midst of a culture that's just broken and so confused. Leadership in cooperation with God. And each of us has a, a specific calling, a way that we're called to kind of live that out vocationally the way that God has crafted for us a pathway to heaven. But along that pathway, one thing doesn't change. The only way for us to actually be leaders according to the heart of Christ is to fall under the grace and accept the gift of obedience. There's no understanding of Christ's masculinity outside of the framework of obedience to the Father. Christ himself says, I came to do the will of the one who sent me. The son can do nothing except what he sees the father do. My bread is to do the will of my father. So it's a hard truth. But if we're going to navigate through what it is to be excellent men, 
what it is to have hearts like Christ's, we also have to navigate what it means to submit to God. What it means to, to recognize our tendency toward competition, toward resisting God, toward not being sure if God is good, to labor for our own moral conversion by accepting God's grace, and then to obey, to be converted. I'm not sure if you've ever had someone explain to you this important word that Christ uses around this topic, meekness. Christ says, come to me, all you who labor and are burdened. I'll give you rest. He says, I'm meek and I'm humble of heart. He says, the meek will inherit the kingdom. Meekness, in English at least, often sounds like weakness. I, I equate it with softness, one who's not willing to fight. But actually, if you go digging and you look up what it is to, to meek a horse, or go look up the Greek word prous, in ancient Greece, we derive the meaning of this term of what it is to be meek. For the Greeks, the warring Greeks, they would, they would bring in these wild stallions and they'd spend time breaking the stallions, training them to take a saddle and a command. And the bulk of the horses would be broken, most of them completely, and they'd become pack animals or farm horses or hobby horses. But a very small group of the horses would submit to being bound, but they would not break. These ones were said to be prous, or they were meeked. These meek horses were the ones who then were sent to war. They could take a warrior upon their back because they would not fall to the din of the battle. They could drive under the command of their rider straight into danger, and they would not flee. They would not freak. They would not fail. To, to be meek is actually to have high command of our will. To be strong enough to fight, but also strong enough to hold back and restrain that impulse when it's inappropriate or not fitting or would be in the way to let our emotions rampage or our brokenness manifest. Christ calls us to that because he did it himself. He establishes it for us as men because he established it for us as a man. And we look to the cross, the high image of man. I hold this up to you as the greatest image of man who is a laborer. That upon the cross, we see the new Adam, the new man who's come to the earth to reclaim everything that was lost by sin and who's willing to die for the sake of that reclaiming. But we tend to look at the cross and just see a man hanging there dying, huh? Sometimes we tend to forget that actually the man hanging there dying is God. And God is hanging there dying in the flesh for the sake of one he loves, a bride. And as the man lays down his life for the bride, the woman, what he's doing is showing us what it actually is to be a laborer whose laborers have a logic, and the logic is love. The, the way of the heart of Jesus Christ, reestablished for us in the new covenant, masculinity reclaimed, Christological masculinity, that is the way of laboring for the bride in love unto whatever the cost may be. And to make that very concrete, gentlemen, some of you are married, this would be obvious, huh? It's for your spouse. But I would expand the idea of Christological masculinity to include the willingness of the man to be a blessing to the woman, to defend her, to fight for her, to protect her, to establish a place in which they can share life. Obvious for marriage. But there's this beautiful cascade of femininity that descends down from the Blessed Virgin Mary. And we can depict or imagine Christ hanging upon the cross. That upon the cross, as he, the God who is also man, laboring in love for a bride, sees the Blessed Virgin Mary, he sees the ideal of the new covenant, the ideal of the church, the image of every woman, ideally, who would come. And he's able to make that offering in love because he sees her beauty, he sees her goodness, and he's willing to fight for it, to claim her back from the serpent, and to establish for her a place, a way to live. That's the church. Mary's the form and the archetype of the church. And so every man, if he wants to be after the pattern of Jesus Christ's own heart, has to be willing to fight for the woman and lay down his life. And the woman may be his spouse, maybe his sister, maybe his friend, but for all of us gentlemen, the woman is also the church. The church is the bride of Christ. And Christ, Paul says to us in Ephesians, he laid down his life that she could live. Every man after the pattern of Jesus Christ is called to lay down his life that she can have life. Every man after the pattern of Christ is called to share in that work of God, that labor, the battle against the forces of darkness, to stand in the truth, to by grace hold high command of his will and recognize when it is fitting to fight and when it is even stronger to hold back and to give, to gift, to bless, to love. This is Christological masculinity. It's when the man is willing to die for the woman, 
for his wife, his sister, his friend, the church, all for the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so men, men of Christ, I would say to you, <laughs> if there's any way to proceed in a confused world about what it is to be men, what it is to be men after Christ's heart, what it is to be men of Christ, there's no way ever to understand that without the Blessed Virgin Mary. Each and every single one of us has to come into a relationship with her that is profound, with her that is profound. Each and every single one of us has to welcome her into our own hearts, in our prayer, our way of living, our moral lives, our devotional lives, our theological lives, because she, as the new Eve, also brings to us the pattern of woman redeemed. And so where we've been broken by our relationships with women or been confused by how to deal with the beauty of woman, her gift and her offering, or her lack of receiving our own offering, it's Our Lady constantly who will come to us to teach us what it is to be men. She formed the new Adam. She's the form of the church. She's the heart of the one for whom each of us must fight with Jesus Christ to defend the bride, to defend the church, to be laborers in love. So brothers, wherever God finds you in your vocational journey, wherever you find yourself on the path to try to figure out what it is to be a man in the midst of a culture that's confused and tells you that you might be toxic or you're not enough or you're too soft, go to Our Lady with those places. Ask her what, what's actually true about your heart, which is the heart of man, given as a gift from God. Man who originally is a laborer, who becomes ever more powerful and ever more complete as he labors in love. This is Jesus Christ. He's given us from the cross his mother, as friend, as bride, and as form of the church. Today, maybe more than ever, it matters that we would fight for this church because this church holds every answer to every question that the human heart could possibly ask. There is no other pathway to heaven. There is no other pathway to redemption, to peace, and to order in our world than through the church that God gave to us because he saw that without this bride, without this church, without this love, we would continue to destroy. In the midst of that destruction, this is the way. It's the way of the woman who comes to the man to perfect his heart. So my prayer, brothers, and let's just pray into it now, is that the Lord Jesus would pour out his Holy Spirit upon each and every single one of us in this moment. That the Lord Jesus, who perfected masculinity, who raised us up to a very high place, who taught us what it is to be strong, what it is to fight, but also what it is to give, to restrain, and what it is to find beauty in the bride, to be pierced by that beauty, to proclaim it poetically, and to fight for it even unto death, that the Lord Jesus would reestablish within us the gift of grace, that he would order our hearts, that he would teach us what needs to go, whatever within us does not look like Jesus, and that he would bless and raise up in us everything that does. Mother Mary, I ask especially that you would come to the hearts of all of the men here, every single man who listens in this moment, and I ask that you would place your hands upon his heart to whisper the truth, the gift of who he is, the gift of his masculinity, the gift of his masculine heart. And I ask Mary that you would, by intercession and by friendship, convoke and deepen a friendship with him, a friendship of love, that he could grow upward in Christ Jesus to full stature, that without fear of his brokenness, with a willingness to submit and obey the Father, he could embrace the gift of what it is to be a laborer, a laborer in love. And so brothers, praise the Lord. I pray this bears good fruit in you. Trust that I will be lifting you up in prayer, especially to Our Lady. I ask that you would do the same for me. Come Lord Jesus, help us to be men after your own heart.